we, we're punching them out now with another Talk Moto podcast, and it is an honour, Wobs. Oh, it yeah. is. It's you an absolute honour. to get this honor. man on for a while. <laughs> Sebastian Tortelli is our guest this week. Um, we're made up about that. You're a busy man, so we're going to try and punch through this as quickly as we can. That'd you, be amazing. We will talk about what you're up to a bit later. Let's dive. I want to dive straight in. Forget all the how you started in this game, which we we maybe find out later. Because I lived the era, because I <laughs> yep. was in the same race, not racing him. I was in I was in the race, but I never raced you. Uh, let's go back to the GP days, the the two fifties first. Do you think the nineties was the, the pinnacle? Do you think it it's gone downhill since then? Because a lot of people do. A lot. Of I people. mean, it was it was a, a super era. I think everything was lined up at this time of the you know of actually my career and then the years of racing i mean the bikes were super performant the crowd was there uh you got the interest of tv was you know starting to get into it we got into it national seems TV. Like there's so much nostalgia for that area now for that yeah, era. i mean uh, you know the names were stars you know what i mean no no it was for me it was uh, one of the best uh, best years of uh, racing yeah. i mean definitely for my career but for the overall race i mean the involvement i think people really got into the sport at that time yeah, and the, at the time, this was before Ricky, you know, the riders were rock stars. Yeah. You know, they were, you know, your Emmigs and your McGraths, and they were big names. You know, they were like stars. And I think before social media made all the riders so accessible to everybody, they were just... Yeah, it's, uh, I think it's the evolution of things. But uh, I think the, the era where we're into was like... I mean, more people came to the races. It was, I guess, more affordable also. Yeah. And then, you know, you create an atmosphere at the events. You know, if, even if you're racing in the US or, you know, it, somewhere in Europe, it was really, uh, I mean, you had supporters who were there to, to yeah. have a crowd. I mean, some of the races in Europe were huge. The no, 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 for sure. I mean, you know, you see the same kind of motocross nation in RNA in France. Yes. You know, well, that crowd was there and intense. And we had that actually almost in every country. Every, every yeah, exactly. You're, pretty you're, you're doing more media now. We, we, we're working you harder than <laughs> back then. Because being a factory rider back then was, was a, obviously a little bit different in the fact that I don't think you had, you had media duties and stuff to do, but maybe not as much as riders do now. Definitely not as much. I mean, you know, the first media lesson that I got was when I went to the US with factory Honda. It was like, when I signed my contract, I had so many media days I had to do with factory Honda. So before the season, they, they hired, I think it was uh, Hart Eggman, who was the guy yeah. who was doing oh, the, Eggman, yeah. Yeah, the announcing. And then he drilled us for two days and we were like oh, You actually had to have like, Co like coaching on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, for, yeah. And because, that was in your contract. Yeah, that was in my contract. And that was wow, the first time actually. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, and it was like, you know, you cannot just put out the names like this, you know, you have to put it in circumstance. And uh, basically, they teach you, you know, how to approach things and how to make it more natural. So it's, it's it, it flows better. Was that sure. you or was that just you or the whole? The no, whole no, there team? was a whole team. I mean, there was Kevin Windham, Ezra Lusk, uh, Michael Pichon. So we were all like, you know, in a room and then yeah. uh, we just had to go to Torrance on that factory place. And we just had two days of media every year. That, that, I find that quite interesting because that's why I wanted to ask whether it was just, you know, for you as a, as a Frenchman coming to the US and then having to learn how to do it. But it's quite interesting that they, everybody had yeah, to Yeah, because a lot of the, you know, the rider interviews are so boring, you know, but I understand it's corporate. You've got to say your things. You've got to say what you're supposed to say. You can't say what you want to say. Unless you get somebody like Jason Lawrence or somebody who runs a yeah, bit off. Yeah, but that was not, he was not a factory rider. No. He never was. You know, it's, uh, I think you have a different of when you sign a contract, you have an engagement. Yeah, and you're, and a, that's, you're a representative of that company. Exactly. And, you know, I mean, if you're not on the right place, I mean, they will find a way to find you. Oh, yeah. For so sure. that, with the media, going back extent to your, your Grand Prix days, for me, um, I was sort of following, loosely following sort of French motocross. So I'd heard your name a little bit, but then Just you, a little, little bit. bit, but then you, you absolutely did in no time at all, like burst onto the world stage. On the I 125, think you did. 25 Kawasaki, yeah. the group. Did it feel like that? I mean, you, you had your plan, you were clearly determined, confident and, and all that. So I don't think it came to a surprise to no, you. No, no, for me, it didn't to come you. to a you surprise, knew. for sure. I mean, oh, it really? was, no, because actually, all my youth career was very successful as far as, you know, from French Championship to European Championship to World Championship. So, I mean, basically it was a, a regular path. And um, to be honest, when I had actually my first World Championship was 96 and 125, it was like... Uh, 16? I was 16, yeah, 17, 16, 17. 
uh, I was that that age. And I was quite uh, a way off being a yeah, world champion but, at know. 16, and I am at 51. <laughs> but he was, um, I was young, and he was my normal path. Yeah. You know, it was not even a question if I was going to be a world champion. But the French Federation always had a good structure. We, we started that stru structure when I think I was 12. Yeah. And we started with Jackie Vimond, yes. who was our first French world champion. And basically, he's the one who selected, you know, a bunch, I think it was six guys and used guys. And then basically, every year we were working out. I mean, uh, we because were Because the French, the French Federation was the envy of a lot of federations. Yeah. They, it was like the yardstick. It's like, with his, we need to do this. Yeah. Look at all the French kids coming through. And, ex and exactly that's the way they did it. Basically, they, I mean, now all the federations are doing a support. But when we had school holidays, basically, we had the coaching time. Yeah. And that was before the coach were actually involved into the sport. And who really. were you on the program with? Uh, Jackie Vimon was the yeah, one who started I mean, the, the program. Riders. Which riders oh, I did with Villemen, yeah. uh, Stefan Oncara, Maschio. Thierry Van den Bosch, who was also a supermoto super world champion, guy, yeah. like six times. Um, just a six-time world champion? Yeah, just six times only. <laughs> uh, I mean, there is Eric Sorby who went to the US, there was Steven, uh, Steve Boniface. Yeah. I mean, there is hey, all the names. Quite like, a bit. Names, yeah, yeah. Names, that like. was basically, they took our generation and then they basically start helping us to, to get where, I mean, where it was. Yeah. And for me, then I made the solution, I mean, the decision, I think I was 14 and I left my town basically to go to Paris, which is like nine hours away, uh, to actually be able to keep my school program on. And actually the French Federation helped me to have two trainings a week of motorcycle, which I never had before with a coach. Yeah. So how, and old, how old were you when you moved? 14? 14. 14 and a half. That's a big, that's a big yeah. thing. That's a big thing. No, no, but I was very, I mean, for me, it was... South of France, aren't you? South of France, yeah. yeah. Uh, south of Bordeaux. And uh, I mean, it was a decision that I made against my parents actually i had to fight with my parents for it i do remember oh well yeah. that's an interesting yeah. story and then that i went it. to i mean uh, i mean it's it was pension yeah. you know you had to to go there and live in paris and i mean boarding school and all yeah. that stuff and you know that was my my goal and when i i mean i got lucky in a way where you know everything was very strict at the school because it was the yeah. only people school for the youth so the french government had that school only for only people athletes and they allow me to go in. And uh, at the same time, you know, I had my training and then I go to the races. Uh, this years I'd never got injured. So it was like, like I say, when I, in 96, I was the world champion. It was just like the regular path of things. So when did the young Sebastian Tortelli, Tortelli look in the, brushing his teeth in the morning or whatever you're doing, look in the mirror and go, I'm gonna be a world champion. When, when, when was that spark ignited? It was never a question. So from the minute you started riding a bike, I mean, that was your, I, I mean, I you, was, you I had was this a, inner confidence that you, were, yeah, you were I mean, I was a racer and I mean, that I'm, you were, I'm a racer. I'll give you that. Yeah. I'm, I'm not, you know, I got into the sport knowing nothing about motocross or supercross, uh, not knowing any names. And I just love the riding and then the, the racing of it. So when I got into it, it was like, okay, you know, here's what we need to do. And my parents do, knew nothing about the sport either. I mean, my dad, I think I was in 65 and uh, the bike was not working. And I'm like, you know, we had to go to the dealer and everything. And then the dealer asked, hey, uh, did you change the air filter? What is an air filter? <laughs> <laughs> that thing there that is uh, brown black. <laughs> yeah, and black. There's no problem. So, yeah, that's, you know, that's where I started. but. I mean, I was very passionate about the race. You know, yeah. the race is what motivated me. And I was very lucky that I was always at the top of my class. So you basically, from an early age, just thrived on competition, like the competition yeah. element. Yeah, it was, it was purely that. Actually, you know, I did the Mini Cross of Provence, which is a very small, uh, like, championship that I won right away. Then I went to the 85 and 65, and I won French championship. And then I went to the 125. Junior finished second, then European finished second. So I was always battling for the championship. So it was like, you know, when I went to the World Championship, the first year I finished third. Uh, and I could have been a hunt, but uh, my carburetor fell off uh, when I was leading a race. <laughs> I want your dad doing the bike. At that no, time. no, that was a mechanic at the time. <laughs> but, you know, and I was like 25 points away, so I could have been there. Um, I mean, I was always in the hunt. So the question of if I was going to become a world champion was not there. It was like, you know, I'm fighting every weekend and 
I need to win, you know, whichever race it is. So very quickly, while we're, we're on that subject, how did the connection with motocross start? If your parents didn't know anything about it? What, was it somebody at school and you just come home and said, Mom, Dad, I want, buy me a bike. I, I want to do this. Santa was very nice to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so just, I mean, it's fascinating no, I mean, how you uh, get excited um, because normally it, it's driven by a, a it's normally driven yeah. by a family member or yeah. actually, you know, I mean, like uh, my you, parents are farmers. Okay, and my dad was uh, love bikes, and uh, basically he decided to buy a bike for the farm to be able to go down the farm, and and that's it. Yeah, you know, for the watering system and whatever, and uh, that bike kept breaking down, and I went with him to the shop, you know to get the parts or whatever and there was a and tiny uh, qr uh, 49 you know yeah. the honda oh, one know like exactly the, PW, the ones. wp50 and i was sitting on it and i was like you know playing with it and was santa good. was very I nice i love that, that story because that's how i started not from a farmer thing exact same thing got dragged to a shop with my brother went to buy him a bike little bike and come out with two bikes and yeah away and Brilliant. that's that's the way it started and then then that was it. I was just riding on the farm. My dad was making jumps. And then a neighbor, a farmer neighbor came and said, hey, you know, they do races for the kids. You should go, you know, next week there's a race going on right there. So I went. My dad said, okay, why not? He's having fun. Let's go. And then I went and actually it was not a motocross race. That was a mob cross race. So with right. mopeds. Oh, no way. So I was racing with kids of 16 and they saw me coming and they said, oh, yeah, the little guy, he can race with us. No problem. And I beat them. And they say, well, next weekend there's a motocross race. You should go to motocross and not keep going with uh, yeah. mob guys. <laughs> that's where that's where the natural aggression comes from. Yeah. Early already yeah. in straight with the big away, you're having straight to in. fight the big kids. But it was, I mean, for me, like I say, it was natural. But I think the what motivated me was the the racing part of it, the competition yeah. of it. And I was doing judo, and I also I was a very performer. I was one of the top of my uh, state. So you know, and. I think I it's think, safe to say you're quite a competitive person, aren't you? Yeah, I'm very competitive. <laughs> I think it's At safe everything. to say <laughs> <Well, laughs> a little bit. Well, I want to touch on that because I've seen it firsthand. As I said, I'm fortunate enough to, to race uh, in 250 GPs when you were obviously winning world titles and, and battling with Stefan. One thing I always, whenever you came by me, I always thought for the split second I saw you before you cleared off the further down the track, by the way, um, you were just so aggressive in your riding style, but like you were solid. Like, I always thought, if anybody tries putting a move on that cat, oh my God, they're done. just going to bounce off you. I mean, you <laughs> yeah, were like uh, that. Yeah. yeah. Like a, no, no. I was... In fairness, you wouldn't, you're not intimidated a lot by many people. No, I I'm mean, not. even when you're in the States, and, you know, they, they do push you around, as you know. Yeah, but, don't... you know, it's, um, for me, it's part of racing. Whatever happened on the track is racing. Yeah. You know, I don't take it personally, and I never took it personally. It was racing, you know. But if you come, don't worry, I will come back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> you and, definitely did that and that's you know that was like you know you want to race no problem you know i'm i made the decision to be a racer and to be actually at the top level and if you come and and rub against me and take me out you know it happened uh for sure no problem i, I mean i accept it i'm i made the decision to yeah. be there but yeah you nobody's know, forcing you to be that guy that's exactly you are. but don't worry i'll be back did that make those Titanic battles that you had with Stefan? Obviously, he also had them in the one two five. Let's not let's not skip over that. You yeah, know, like the with mailing, mailer and all that. We all remember the mailing race, Fox yeah. Hill. Fox Hill, or actually in uh, Belgium. Belgium. Belgium was Nimes. Yes. We had quad a race there. Yeah. I can, I think I had the bruise from the the frame of the Yamaha. Yeah. I mean, how many times did you pass? <laughs> I mean, how many passes for the lead in that race? It was like three or four a lap. Oh, for sure. I mean, it was uh, Nimes was I think the most intense with the poll that we had. Yeah. I mean, See, it this was is the point that I make. No, I'm not interrupting. You ask anybody what's the best race you've ever seen, and I will put a hundred pound on. It's a one two five race somewhere. Uh, I mean, it's a one two five race. You know, it that normally nobody is ever says right. four fifties. Yeah. It's always like, oh, but for me, you know, it was, it was Rhino and Brownie going at it at high, uh, high, high point. Yeah. But you know, to see you and Mailer going at it, you know, was something else. I mean, that was the yeah the second year one twenty five went out the world championship, but you know, I mean. I was very aggressive even the year before. I think that was my first year actually as a factory rider with Ian Groot, yeah, as Groot, a yeah. Kawasaki, uh, uh, it was JHR, the HK, and uh, had so many crashes. I mean, that was before the twin wall from rental. Uh, that was just a tiny rental. And uh, 
I think Jan was so scared uh, that he, uh, Rental could think he was selling, bar, uh, selling bars. Yeah, you had to change them every time you wrote it. Yeah, I think <laughs> I bent like 50 or 60 bars that season. Yeah. And they, then he did a me package you, and told, then send them back to rental because they, it says, I'm not selling it, it's just Sebastian. No, they told me you bent them without crushing. That's yeah, what I, I did. Mean, actually. I'm going I mean, back to how do you do that? How do you do that? Like you wanted to bend the bike. Yeah, yeah. That's I nearly was, impossible. You I were was pretty solid. <laughs> you were solid, man. I, I give you that. I give you credit where credit's due. You were a trier. You didn't ever go home thinking, we should have tried harder. No, no, no. But I had, I had full trust uh, in Jackie Vimond, yeah. you know, who was my trainer for many years. And if he was like, I mean, yeah, you could do, you couldn't jump this. You you can do it. Yeah. So I was not even a second question in my mind. It was like, okay, I'll do it. How much did Jackie help you? Because from what I remember of Jackie's riding, I'm old enough to just about catch the tail end of his career. You know, he, he was a different rider to, to what you were in, in, in you know, yeah. like a bit more sort of smooth and calculated. I guess he really worked that into, you know, yeah, for sure. to try I mean, and smooth you out, but not take away your natural aggression yeah for sure he did uh i mean jackie was a, a i think the 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 first big influence that i had i mean i had two big influences in my career as far as riding style was jackie for the mx yeah. and uh, ricky johnson for the supercross side um and uh, jackie i mean he's the one actually who when i was a kid i was not as aggressive but he was able to m keep me aggressive and on the same side gain the technical part of it I mean, I looked aggressive and I could go through bumps with no problems, uh, but there was a technical part of it that people maybe looked more at my, you know, the way I, uh, I was, I mean, I have a, a long torso, so I look very strong on the bike, even if I'm not that tall. And uh, people would say, oh, I mean, he's, he's going through the roughest sections, but I knew how to get through the roughest sections, and that's what people didn't see. I'm glad you said that, because that, uh, I can remember talking about that with Mark Eastwood and all those guys, like, Tortelli is always doing that shortest line. How does he? God, how does he go through there so that's fast? That's so part. rough. <laughs> yeah, but that's you know I'd that's why I'd be going three times out of my way to avoid any type of bike a bump. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, but that's wrong. But that but was the, just that like was really slamming stuff. Yeah, because I knew how to handle it, and that was the technical part that I worked a lot with mm. Jackie when I was young. And I mean, I was able to play with the bike. You know, you give me a big bump, so I was able to go through it fast because I knew how to handle it and which way to hit it. And from the outside, I mean, that guy used the roughest line possible. Yeah. But there's a way to go through it. No, I'm loving this. You were a technical great... guy because when I was around you at Suzuki, and I, was, I was your goggle guy for uh, yeah. five years or something. Well, I don't Smith, know. Long, long, long time, time yeah. Time, and then yeah. your helmet guy. We, yeah. But I'd always talk to your mechanic, Tony Baluti, and Tony would be like, He's, he knows what he wants and just give him what he wants. And I'm like, all right, because when I was first with you, I was like, try this, try, you like, give me this. And once I gave you what you wanted, that was the end of it. No problem. Everything no, no, no. was easy, you know. Yeah. You knew what you wanted. Give him what he wants, and he he won't like other riders were constantly messing. No, no. Uh, once you got what you needed, that was the end of it, and it was like, well, oh, that's easy. I can deal with that. So, yeah, I mean, that's I think I mean that's still the way I am. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm a little bit sometimes too white and black. I would say, you know, uh, the grey area is not my area. Yeah, but that was, that, that's <laughs> easy then. When you're not when you're dealing with grey areas, you don't know where you stand. We know where we stood. Mm. No, no, it no, for sure. Good, you I know? Mean, for me, it was, I mean, that does make things very simple at the end of the day. Yeah. You know, people like you, don't like you. I mean, that's different. But, you know, at the end of the way, when you know what you want, I mean, that's, you know, I think, and every, should be every top athletes have, you know, that kind of decision because you cannot waste time with uh, stuff that, I mean, take your time for no reason. I'm looking forward to finding out of the rider that you were now translate into team management but we'll we get to that in a minute because i got definitely another, want to I got talk about that story. i was at the kawasaki test track fuck what year was it i don't even know what year it was supercross uh, no, yeah supercross so before, that could be only 98 yeah but this was study the season yeah but this was when you were still in europe and yeah, you, you came i think it was maybe it was 97 coliseum, you came to california LA coliseum? I, I was like uh, i was at jim castillo place from cti from 95 to 98. Yeah, well, anyway, I'm at the test track, the carry test track, and Jeff Ward's there, and you've come along and come through the gate, and Jeff Ward started to give it, oh, you're not allowed in, he didn't know who you were. Uh, <laughs> and I'm like, dude, sure. that's like the one two five world champion. <laughs> He's fine to come in, I'm sure. And it was just like trying to explain to Jeff Ward who you were. That's yeah, it was just like an old guy, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. Trust me. And he was my hero, actually. Yeah. They oh, soon, Ward was. They soon knew who you were a few years later. Well, so, that was 98 the first round you won. Nobody yeah, won. Yep. Dude, 98. Him, right? I followed about 100 bucks on that, you know, made some bank. 
Oh, you did? Well, nobody would have had money on you. No, for sure. <laughs> no, that's for sure. Even me. <laughs> I'm trying to put, what's that, LA Coliseum? LA Coliseum. LA Coliseum. Yeah. Yeah. So last time it was LA Coliseum. Yeah, 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 that was the last really last Coliseum. Coliseum. Yeah, yeah I remember that. that many, though. No, I had no, money. Well, no, not for us. I had money not on for you. Us. Not exactly. for us. I had money on you at Anaheim 05 at the start, a muddy race. Oh, uh, I think it's podium, but not. Yeah, you were podium. Yeah, podium. But as a goggle guy, all my guys finished with the goggles on that race. <laughs> it, was, very it, was you, it was you and Travis and I think Ezra. The, oh, yeah, three guys in the yeah. main, they all finished with the goggles on. No, Listen, before, we, before we get on to talk, because we definitely want to talk a little bit more about America before tell we me, talk about me. what you're doing now, let's, let's sort of bookend the, the GP days then. So before we started this thing, we were just talking about, for me, like the 98 battle was oh, Titanic, okay, um, between yeah, you, and, unreal. you and Stefan. Um, it came down to the last round in Greece. Yeah, you it? obviously, like you said, you'd likely thrive on the competition. So looking back on that season, what, was it fun or was it... Oh, you know, now your racing career is over. Did you enjoy that constant year battle? Or what did it bring stresses that you didn't really, you know? I cannot say I enjoy it. I mean, I did enjoy it because it finished well for me yes. at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, definitely it was stressful times. And that season had, uh, I mean, a lot of up and down. So it was pretty stressful. And um, I mean, it was, uh, it was definitely a tough season. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, uh, I would say I, I didn't go every day, you know, to work, I meaning training, and uh, with a smile on my face. <laughs> I mean, I had to, I mean, I pushed hard, and so I always pushed hard. But Going was, back uh, to it, the, the last round was in Greece, I believe. Yeah. It was How many Greece, points? Yeah. Do you remember going in? I went in, I went in with uh, nine points back. You were nine points behind going into points Greece. Back. And didn't they draft Rhino in? Uh, Jan de Groot tried to get Rhino in. And actually, uh, Dave Grant, who was the manager, yeah. uh, pros uh, I mean, did a protest because uh, he entered uh, Rhino too late. Uh, okay. You had to be at the time entered like a month before or something. Okay. So, I mean, they had to manage that protest yeah, yeah. Uh, to not let him ride. And you came away with what lead? You won it by how many points? Uh, four or five oh. or six. So it's a hell of a well point ball in the last round. Yeah, I Against mean, it was. Stephen, I mean, let's be honest. It was simple. For to be able to win the the championship was one guy had to finish second between uh, Stefan and me, and after one uh, both models. Yeah. And then I would have ended up with two point lead, and that was enough to get the championship. So it was like, you know, Pete Bayer actually was the one who finished second in the first model. Uh, he had also his own revenge against Honda because. They promised him a factory bike, and um, they didn't give it to him. Oh. And he actually signed with uh, Kawi the following year. So basically, he was getting my bike. And uh, he raced, and he was in the lead, and I was second. And I was riding, the first model, I think it was the worst model of my life for me and Stefan, actually. Yeah. And we were riding so bad. Really? And at some point, I couldn't catch up Pete, who was in front of me. And I could see that he was like somewhere waiting for me. And I'm like, dude, I, I, cannot, I cannot get there. And then I, I get there and I pass him and two corners later I crash and he passed me back. And he's like, you know, and then I come and then he goes outside to let me the inside so I can, I can get the lead and win the model. But it was like, I mean, I was so stressed out. Yeah. And we both had actually, Stefan and myself had the, that, pressure actually yeah. on the first model was yeah, that's, what, that's what i mean like was it was yeah. it in, it was very like intense. it couldn't have been enjoyable like you, no, you know no. like the whole thing of it did come down to you two and the lead up to it and then you'd have probably been in the gym thinking of potentially thinking of him and how to beat him he's thinking of you and just the whole well, actually you everybody. know the, the week we had the the weekend before we had the the swiss gp that i won and that week actually i never touched a bike i went i went out jet ski and i came early to greece went to the beach and then I played tennis and I didn't touch the bike at all. And I went to the, to the actually to the final, just, you know, the two practice yeah. and, and everything. I was like, I, I mean, I did my work and it's not one week that I'm going to change. No, it's funny. funny. It's nine point, other, other nine points say behind. That. Yeah. The pressure's not on you. No, no, no. The pressure's but on actually, uh, this on, championship to lose. Yeah. And the first model was very stressful. The second model where we are two points apart, where, you know, the one who win will win the championship. Yeah. Zero stress. Because I suppose Cause it all just came down to like, that's it. Yeah. It's, it's all in yeah. on that last moto. Whatever will be, will be, I guess. Yeah. 
And, and then at the time, actually, when I left the truck, uh, you know, with my ex-wife, I was like, when I come back, I'll be world champion. I was like... You were calm. Yeah, I was like, no, no question. <laughs> and you just told us before you came on air, you, you, you actually spoke to Stefan just not too far start. before before gate drop you yeah. went and i shake his head many people do that like, which i never did in ever but i was like so, so confident that i just went and then i just shake his hand and tell him good luck but it was like for me it was just the thing to do yeah ask me this uh, if you can or so i remember the race going on you're battling for the championship and then he crashed after i passed him yeah after you passed so did, did what happened with the pit crew? Did they tell you that it crashed or did you see it yourself? And if you no. did, what no, went no. through your mind when he went down? I mean, I went to the moto and I had a game plan. You know, my game plan was very simple. I know that he was weak at 20 minutes out of the 40 minute moto. Yeah. He had like a little dip at, at that time. And my plan was you get there and you need to wait 20 minutes behind him. Just wait. And then when you, you make any give you the half time, just Only. you need to hire him. I mean, you need to, to be on him and just make it happen. And that's what I did. My mechanic showed me, you know, half a lap, I mean, halfway. And then the two corners later, I over jumped and then I just went and I pushed him into the fence. And I'm like, you know, now is uh, the time of your life. You know, that's it. it's like make a lap time like you never did ever in your life. Did it feel like the longest race of your life? After that, yes. Yeah. Because I, like, I came. Yeah, when, when's the last lap flag? When's I that? mean, I came and I did like I, I didn't look back and I'm like, you know, is the time you need to go. And I did like the I like I, I gave everything that I got, and I came around because it was like just a lap, and my mechanic goes plus nine, nine second. Yeah. And I'm like, uh, maybe I didn't read that right. right. <laughs> so I go around another lap, plus twelve. And I'm like, oh, wow. Then you start, okay. then your brain then, starts. You know what? I heard every single noise of my brain. Yeah, yeah, that. so that so many times. I'm like, you know, I was scared to jump. Yeah. To break the wheels. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, was, I mean, I was the last 15 minutes of the model. I was so scared that anything could happen. How was the reaction afterwards? Did, how was Stefan in defeat? Did he? come up and see you afterwards? Yeah, he won and yeah. congratulate me. And then after he fall down and, and I mean, he sit down and yeah, I mean, all the pressure came down and, and that was it. I mean, for me, it was, uh, you know, amazing. But the, the story of it is the following weekend, actually I raced with the exact same bike. And I was doing the French Championship, three moto formats. First moto, I broke the subframe of the bike. Not, I mean, just the thing broke. I go for the second moto, just behind the starting gates. I had an issue with the engine. Uh -huh. Came back, fixed it. I go to the main event. My rear brake pedal, the, the piston broke. And I over jump a jump, broke my leg. So glad you got it wrapped up when you did, by the Imagine. sound of it. I mean, but that 98 was one of the best championships. I think no, it, it was, yeah, was brilliant. As a, Very as, a, as a fan, it was, because it was good to see. You had the up and downs. I had my strong time and then Stefan had his strong time. And then, I mean, actually, it was like a really up and down for both of us during that, se that season. And he came up to the end. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite a bit some And challenge. then 99, you went to America for Honda. Yeah, I went to America for Honda for 99, which I signed already my contract in May. Uh, before in May. Was, in May. Oh yeah. my God! Just before we get into that, um, if you are getting any background noise, we apologise for that. We're going to do the best we can with the audio <laughs> because we managed to grab Seb at the arena cross because he's a busy man, but the guys are still building the track. So if you are getting a bit of background noise, get a bit closer. That, that, that's Just why. Try. Just a little um, bit closer. We've got to grab Seb while we can because we don't get many <laughs> opportunities with this. So I find that also quite fascinating that you one two five world champion, you then win a two fifty but your mind, you'd already agreed to go. So, what, you and what's your sorry, motivation to go to America? You already agreed Why? to go was to America. Was it always like, I want to go to the I States, I want to go the, to the States? For me, it was the regular path. You know, GMB opened the, the path. Yeah. As uh, you know, you do the world championship and then the next level is the US. Yeah. You know, if you want to be good at uh, racing and supercross, you got to go to the US. Yeah. And uh, I did my thing with the world championship and I was like, okay, next level. You know, next level is the U.S. And that's, uh, 
Basically, I think it's uh, GMB who was able to, as a French guy, program us. Yeah. Like, Paved the way, really. Yeah, he because, paved like, the way. Because a lot of French sure. guys went to the States. Yeah. Like, it was the next thing to do. Like, it was always seemed to be their target. It was yeah. always like... But we were lucky because we had French Supercross Championship, uh, which was, you know, a lot of round and good level. And, I mean, there was many things, like you say, it was the era of, of the sport for yeah, me. Yeah, I think so. Because, I mean, in Supercross in France, you had like at least 30 Supercross in the summertime. Yeah. You know, two or three every weekend. Really? That you could enter to and, uh, and with good levels. So it was very like, I mean, that was part of the sport for us at that time. I was doing the World Championship, plus the French Championship, plus the French Supercross. I mean, it was, you know, racing was, uh, was at the peak for sure. When you got there, you know, was it what you expected to be or was it tougher than you imagined? You, you know, because most people, when they go, they go to the States, it's the intensity for the first five laps that catches a lot of guys out and that never bothered you. No, 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 that didn't bother me. Um, I think the biggest change was for me, uh, not the lifestyle, because it, it's very easy to adapt and be on your bubble to be able to race. But I think it was the fact that you're not anymore in, in your country with your environment. I mean, you don't have the people that you know that are not necessarily are part of the sport, mm. but make your, you know, your, your thing, yeah, your yeah. bubble. And actually you go there, and for me it was like, I mean, my wife and I. And that was like, that was like, I mean, it was a small bubble. And I think that was the hardest part. Even if your focus is, it just, when you're there, you realize that, okay, you're in a different world. It's not, you know, where you're, you come from. No. And there's that step to do. And that's why when I saw, you know, this year Prado going there, yeah. and I'm like, he did the same things that I did, which was going to the, you know, uh, SX class, the, the main class. And for me, I think it was my mistake uh, to have gone to the SX class directly because- oh, really? On the Supercross, you still have to learn so much. I think the light class would have been a, a better suited place to learn. And then you can go MX. But would you, would you have still done, would you have done the, the, the lights class for the outdoor? Or you'd have gone, no, no, no so MX. Just for, I mean, for Supercross. Just for Supercross. Yeah. Because you're going there and you're trying to tame a different beast. Yeah. I mean, Supercross in the US is nothing that you have anywhere else. Yeah. I mean, and that's, even if you're a supercross rider and start riding quite a bit on supercross, you need to learn something different. And that's a, a big, big step that people sometimes don't realize and they don't want to step down. And sometimes you need to be humble. I mean, you have to be, you know, going down to be able to go yeah. back up. Yeah. And MX, I mean, outdoors uh, on the big bike, I say no problem. It's natural, it's what you do. You did it for many years. Yeah. But when you go supercross, the intensity, and I mean, the all riders going out there for many years, it's, it's a, I mean, maybe you're going to be fast on the, on the practice track, but when you go to the racetrack, which is a different track every weekend, and you have 10 factory guys who are super fast, it's a different world. And it never, TV never does it justice, does it? Like, until no. you get down on that stadium floor, and you see the size of things and how steep, how steep they are. They are yeah. and what, there's, no, there's not much room for error, right? And they came down quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, I know. They were even yeah. bigger then, weren't they? I mean, when yeah, I was a mechanic, used to be you stand in the so middle steep. of the floor and it's all around you. And you're thinking, Jesus, when you sit in the stadium, you're only seeing three sides of it. But when you're on the floor in the middle, you're seeing it all. And the floor would shake when these guys would land because it's like grass, wood, right, dirt. Right, yeah. And like these guys would be landing that hard, the ground would shake, and you're like, Jesus. No, no. And it was, some of the times it was so close to the jumps, and it was gnarly. You know, it was just. I mean, I think you look at these days, the track, you know, before it looks like Supercross was trial. You know, yeah. we were like, you know, so high and so steep and a little bit, not, not as much speed. And today we got to the point where you got quite a bit some speed, the jumps are way bigger. I mean, the, the, the sport evolutes, and it's, uh, I mean, it still is super cross. Yeah. And it's just the regular thing, evaluation with the, with the bikes. And that's, uh, I mean, don't, I mean, if somebody tell me super cross is easier today, I would say, no, it's, it's as difficult as it was. It's just a different, different angle. But believe me, super cross is tough. It is well, tough. I think, I think the tracks have evolved with the bikes. For sure. You know, and I think 
moving on, it's going to evolve again with the electric stuff. That's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's what you, hey, don't you, push a courier, <laughs> I'm there already. <laughs> but no, but that's, you know, the, there were different power delivery again. You know, the four stroke was different to the two stroke. Yep. And, you know, on the two strokes, we had to have factory gearboxes and stuff because you guys were shifting on the face of jumps. True. To, to get the drive. And that thing bogged. It was all over. It was a big yeah. problem, you know. And now four strokes, you don't have that problem. And it's, they seem to have the jumps so close to the corners. Yeah, I know. I mean, go, I mean before, you, you could go on the inside and, and make things different. Uh, now, I mean, four stroke, you're almost only on the outside. Yeah. I mean, you see rarely a guy going to the inside. No. Uh, because, I mean, there is so much momentum going on. And yeah. that's, you know, I mean, like I say, it's the evolution of the sport. Yeah, and the four strokes get across the whoop so much easier compared with the two stroke. If you don't, it was, you know. I mean, you still take some big... Uh, big hooners to, get across <laughs> to, to go through it. I mean, when you see the whoops in the US, I mean, they are not round. No, I mean, they are yeah. walls. Yeah. And, you know, to, when you, you have to commit and you go and you click fourth gear yeah. before you enter, I mean... And your front wheel has to touch every one. Yeah, you're doing it an injustice. Actually, it, it takes commitment to walk through them, doing the track walk, <laughs> let alone ride the flat. I remember I was at one Supercross, and Ricky was hitting it in the middle, coming towards us into the mechanics area. And I spoke to him because come around to your truck, and I said, "Everybody's going to the left. Why are you going in the middle?" He said, "Because if I'm in the middle and it starts to go, I've got time to save it. <laughs> if I'm on the left and it goes left, I'm done." And he said, hey, "There was hay bales. There was not yeah, by hay the time. bales." And he said to me, "Where are you standing?" I said, "In the mechanics area." He said, "I wouldn't stand there." <laughs> and why? He said, oh, "I'm not in control. Don't think." And that, I thought, no, maybe he was on a Honda at the time. Yeah. And it, he said, yeah, "It's touch and go. If I make the end I mean, of them whoops every lap." To make it easy, you know, when I walk the track at the time, I will come, you know, in front of the whoops. I will, you know, lean down and make sure they were aligned, or if they were, to see if some were not aligned, and I will walk around the whoops because I didn't want to walk through it. They were so deep. Yeah. I didn't want to know how deep they were. I'm no, like, you're not going to be in that. are they lined up? Yeah, you know, this one is a little bit higher. Okay, you that's it. just I, wanted to see the bit that you, you wanted see. to see. That, that's it. That's the only bit you're going to touch. I don't want to be scared. Hopefully. I don't look at the rest. I know I can go through it. I will go through it. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't look at deeper they are. It is gnarly. It is outdoor, really Outdoor, though, scary. the outdoor tracks coming off the back of winning two world titles in Europe, you must have loved that. Big, wide oak, because they are different, the European tracks. They are. Yeah, and but I they're guess smoother, they aren't they? Like, they're not you know, gnarly. Because you came I mean, out swinging at Glen Helen and, and, yeah. and smoked everybody at the first national. I remember yeah. that. No, no, no fear it, kit, number 44 on a Honda, yeah, yeah. looking ridiculously cool. The champ, no. the world champs in the house, bang. Yeah, yeah no, I mean, whether, you know, let's say in Europe, you could at the time find a line that was somewhere smooth. In the US, you could try right, left, middle, up and down. There was no, no yeah. smooth area. I mean, you had to go through it. And no matter what you did, it was like, you know, bumps or no bumps, you will have bumps all the way across. Yeah. Because so even time, though the tracks were wider, it was it, it, it was destroyed. It, I mean, yeah. it was. I Certainly with Glen Helen. I mean, there's a few tracks. Yeah. On the east coast, are well prepared, aren't they? And they're like. But you know, they had the amateur days before, and yeah. they sometimes, most of the time, they didn't redo the track. No. So you came in, the track was already on your first lap, hammered. Yeah. It was like beat up to to death. I mean, it was like, do I find a line? Yeah. There is no line to find. I mean, you can no. look for it, you won't find it. Yeah, but that's what you like. You like. Yeah, like no, I mean, that's where you benefit. That's, that's why that's I was like, I loved out. it. Yeah. I mean, it was you know, it was intense, but it was amazing. I mean, I loved you know my time racing in the US. I mean, it was definitely you know a different experience from Europe, and it was. I mean, like I said, I was not deceived. You know, I went there because I thought it was uh, you know a high level. Yeah. And it definitely it was. You know, it was at the time it was. Today, I mean, the Europe took uh, the, the sport to another level in motocross. Um, so I wouldn't say, you know, like there's a big difference or there's not actually maybe in the other way, actually, for, for motocross, where Europe got better than, than the U.S. But at the time when I was racing, it was like U.S. was a, a step above yeah. that you had to, to go to. Any regrets on your American career? Any regrets? On a personal level, you know, How long were you there for? Because you did three oh, years, I lived there three for years at Honda. years. But uh, Did you get that long? Yeah, I lived 22 wow. years in the US. Uh, but racing was, uh, I think, uh, nine, nine, ten years. Nine, ten years. Yeah. yeah. Um, any regrets? Uh, like I said, yes. Yeah. I should have done the Supercross in the light class the yeah. first year. That's my only regrets. And the you rest, think that would have maybe 
I think it would have made a big difference. It would have set you up more for longevity and less, yeah. you know. But especially that, uh, that year I got uh, uh, before I started the season uh, on the 450, I mean, on the 252 stroke Honda, I injured myself uh, after my world championship, broke my foot, and actually on the Honda, which was a new bike for me, I had only uh, two weeks before I started the season. So I was really not at the place where I was supposed to be. And if I would have done the East Coast, that would have given me more time to be ready and everything. But I mean, I didn't have the people around me who advised me uh, on the right side. And I mean, that's the way it was. And I did it, you know, I didn't, with a little bit more brained, uh, brain, I would have uh, looked at it a little bit different. I bet your parents look back at that point thinking, yeah, okay, you did make a good career choice because they, they, you know, they try to steer you away from riding a bike. There you are. Could have been a farmer. No, you could, could have been have, a farmer. Maybe. No, that's, you know, that's the thing in my life that's even that I, I knew, you know, and uh, my parents always knew it. It's like since I was a kid, I say, you know, I see you working too hard and I think the, what you're doing is not fair because, you're, you know, the weather can be hard and you don't deserve. I mean, you won't get what you deserve from the crops and, and you know, yeah. everything. I say, I'll never be a farmer. I say, you know, I'll do something in my life, but I will never be a farmer. I, you know, what you do is amazing, but it's, I don't think you, you get the reward of what yeah, actually you, put, you yeah. do yeah, for the effort. Yeah. And I say, you know. I'll be there, I'll come and I'll help you, you know, but I'm, I know how to do everything at the farm, you know, ride the tractor, I mean, do everything from A to Z, but I'm like, that, this is not for me. I need to do something else. There was a, there was a kid with a plan. Yeah, Definitely. no, that was, you, you know, that was- what you wanted to do. Yeah, and, and you know, like I say, you know, sports and, and racing or competition was my thing. And if that was not a motorcycle, if we had put a racket in my hands and uh, that was tennis, it would have been the same. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I was very self-driven on that side. So that, that's a nice little segue to lead to where you are now. Um, the determination to succeed, to be the best with all your riding experience as a factory rider, testing bikes, all those things. No wonder the guys from Stark um, got you involved. How did yeah. that come about? Is that just a phone call out of the blue? No, no, what, actually, uh, yes, yeah, kind of. I mean, it was, um, I, I mean, things happen, you know, Sometimes things happen because they have to happen or they, they happen because you are the right place at the right time and you provoke it. Um, but on the stock story was, I mean, I was working with uh, Carl Osterman at Fox, you know, uh, and I was working yeah, with the Fox you, teams you and, and I came here yeah, for many years. Them, yeah. And uh, basically I was talking to a friend um, who was at the beginning of stock. And actually he didn't end up working with stock, but he was supposed to. And uh, he called Anton and he says, hey, you know, I mean, there's that guy that is, uh, you know, racing, he used to be a racer. He's the guy who developed the first Honda 450, the first uh, RMZ. Uh, he did some electric work with the, some of the US brands. You should, you know, talk to him. He's in Barcelona and you're in Barcelona. And he's like, oh, yeah, OK, why not? You know, let's let's make a, an appointment. And then uh, my friend said, hey, you know, you need to call Anton. I say, what about? Well, I cannot tell you. So is that because you know we had an NDA, yeah, which yeah. is a uh, you know the, you sign the contract that you're, you're not, not supposed to disclose yeah. what you're doing. Uh, so he had the NDA in place. He says, I cannot tell you, but you need to call him. So I'm like, what about? Sorry, you know, I insisted. He says, no, I can't. But call him. I think you you like it. Okay, so I call Anton. And uh, say I talk to Anton. He says, "Okay, you know what? What, what are we? Uh, talk, uh, you know what do we want to talk about?" I say, "I cannot tell you. You need to come send the NDA. Then we can start discussion." I'm like, "Send me the NDA. I want to read it." <laughs> so I read the NDA. I'm like, "Okay, I can sign that. We can make a meeting." So I went and I signed the NDA, give it to him, and I uh, say, "I want to start an uh, uh, electric bike," and I'm like well, I'll stop you right there. You know, that was my first reaction. <laughs> I'll stop you right there. I mean, I've been riding electric bikes, you know, in the US and in, in Europe, you know, uh, Carl uh, Osterman had an electric arena. So yeah. I've been there and I, I rode, it's a lot of fun, but you know, the bikes that we have these days, I mean, they are not more cross bike and I don't want to put my name behind something like that. You know, he says, no, 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 don't, don't worry. We want to make a 450. I'm like, a 450? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, a 450. 
And I'm like, do you have, you know, drawings or something that you can show me? <laughs> because, you know, 450s, you know, is, you know, even the Alta was not a 450. It was a 350 uh, or, or a little bit above yeah. a 250. He says, yeah, 450. I'm like, okay, you know, show me the drawing. And then we start talking and he showed me the drawings. And I'm like, actually, okay, that's uh, something that uh, uh, I want to do. Yeah, okay, you, you got me interested. Yeah. And I'm like, you know. I was kind of fading away from the sports and I wanted to go a different direction. I mean, I, I put my apartment for sale in Barcelona and I was ready to move out. Say, well, you, you got me to change. Uh, now I'm going to have to change everything again. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> so yeah. you, were, you were planning like exit strategy was, from the sport. What, yeah, like, I was. What, just uh, try something I new? Think like, I, yeah. I, what, yeah what you... No, I don't know. I mean, I had enough and I'm like, okay, uh, you know, I can see ahead, of my, you yeah. know, ahead and I have time to see something else. So I'm like, you know, I was like, well, your, your program, I like your program, so I will stick to it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, that's, uh, I like, you and know. that's before they even had a bike? I haven't, no, the bike was not written yet. And I was still, you know, the prototype with all the, you know, sketch and everything. So, I mean, actually that was 2019. Oh, shit. So that was early. So I didn't start actually working with stock uh, until 2020 after the summer. Yeah. yeah, that was popping in and out uh, of the office, and I was like, you know, still working as far as giving, you know, no, no, this, that shouldn't be like this, you know, for that reason, or for the writer's perspective of writing. And so I was, you know, once, once a month I was popping in and talking about, the, you know, what they were doing on the bike until, you know, I came in and start the prototype and write with the prototype. So you've played, it's not just managing the team on the ground. I mean, you've been writing from the start the whole... I think the whole yeah. program, you know, testing, offering ideas with everything, how to manage the team, the marketing, the whole nine yards. You're I in. mean, marketing, uh, you know, Benjamin Cobb is, uh, is a great yeah, guy well, for marketing. Yeah, so yeah. I won't take anything, no, any no. credit for that. But, but, it, but what I mean by that is like I think, start, you know, it's great to have a, a recognized name with any product. Right? You know, we've oh, now, sure. seen, now seen Ricky sign up with Triumph, you know, the, yeah. see Caroli's now on the Ducati. Yeah. I mean, when it I, definitely helps. When I started, uh, I think the guys were not even five guys yeah. in, the, in the company. I mean, we had Paul Susi, who did the, basically is the guy behind who did the, the whole development of the bike and the, all the sketch and all the, you know, everything to yeah. create the bikes. And then when I came in, uh, was purely a prototype, the first video we did and everything. And it was like, you know, I remember still the first day, you know, we got the bike and he said, okay, you know, we're going to go ride it now. And I was like, you know, I mean, we still had 3D printed uh, plastics. I mean, it was like, you know, it was the, the first part. And that was like, you know, the bike was super heavy. I mean, did, did it surprise you? Like, because that would have been your, guess, your first, yeah, first proper go on, a, on an electric Mercos bike. Yeah, that. Did it, I mean, did it genuinely I surprise before, you? So I uh, was no problem. Oh, okay. So I knew, I knew what, you know, electric. But I was like uh, expecting, um, I didn't know what to expect. Mm. So I came in and the first time, and I was riding, uh, testing with a, a, another brand at a different track. Yeah. And then the, the bike came and I say, okay, you know, time to go and, and roll it and, and, and go for, you know, first lap and second lap and checking things out and then go. And then, I mean, I had a, the first bike was straight a good feeling. Yeah. It was like the, the benchmark was already like, that's, I mean, we are already in a good place. The first day, and at the end of the day, I decided to go back to the Thermic bike to, you know, to see where we are. And I'm like, I did a half a lap, come back to the mechanics, and I'm like, can you check? I think the, 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 the brake pedal is, uh, is, is, is sticking because, I, I mean, I feel like, you know, something, I mean, it's dragging. Yeah. And, and they looked at it and said, no, everything is good, sir. And it was like right away, I'm like, okay. You know, I saw the big difference in it, and I'm like, well, you know, we start with a good product already from, from prototyping and then the evolution was to, to get everything lined up and, and make everything better. And especially for production, which I think, you know, the next step was how to handle the production side of it after I've done the testing with prototype. A prototype is always the, I would say the easiest part because you can change, you know, the pieces uh, very quickly and it's, it's a prototype. So we did a lot of evolution on the first year on the prototype. 
until we got to the uh, basically the production, yeah. which is uh, getting a production bike is another step and another evolution. Yeah, because it's got to be mass produced, all those exactly. kind of things. And especially but, when you have a new technology. Yeah, yeah. It's going good though in Arena Cross. Um, yeah, you yeah. You guys are currently <laughs> leading the team championship. You've got Jack Brunel leading the actual championship. Uh, how are you finding uh, managing the team with that? Because I'm going to bring this up because obviously like Jack has his ways and he was telling me about, he's like, well, Seb's telling me uh, what, you know, what I should be doing there. And I've, I kind of got to listen because, well, he's like a world champion <laughs> and he's like, I'm, I'm trying to explain to him that's not how I ride, but I've got a kind of like, so how, how are you tra the transition of being a racer and knowing, but then getting that message across to different riders that have all got different characters. Is that been a, is that been a challenge for that you? Was, that no. was different when RJ was teaching you Supercross. Yeah, me Supercross or even, uh, I mean, Ricky. And I think that's the good side of, uh, as uh, I was also a trainer for many, for many years, you know, like that's something that I learned in, in actually with the FFM is uh, the French Federation is there is no bad rider. There's only bad trainers because the trainer is the one who needs to adapt to the rider. Yeah. And, and when, you know, because to be uh, in France, to, to get the diploma of being a trainer, you need to pass a certain, you know, degrees in psychology and anatomy and, and stuff like that. So we are, you know, back to school basically. And, uh, I liked a lot that sentence because actually that's true. You know, a trainer or a writer, um, they have their way of things. And to be better, for to help him, you have to be in his shoes or be able to make the message where he can understand it that profit him. And that's, I think, the first part of a trainer. That's the first challenge that you get. And so, as a team manager, so what's the what's the future? Start. Is it going to no, be the two, like, a Grand Prix team? Oh, I mean, a, a we, are, team? we are open to doing everything, actually. You know, the, the factory wants to do all the championships. You know, we wow. want to enter as a Supercross cool. A team. We want to enter the FIM World Championship. And it will take a little bit more time, you know, because I think some, some of the sanctioning body are not very hot right now uh, with us entering. No. So we have a little bit of, uh, you know, some work to do to, to be uh, accepted, there, yeah. accepted for sure. I mean, it's like a new technology come in, you know, when the four stroke came in, there was a lot of pushback and, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and, but that was a thermic, so that was still okay. We, we have, I think, you know, when I looked at, and that's why I went actually with uh, Stark is, I mean, I was one of the first pioneer to start on the 450s and put together in place the 450. I went to Japan with Honda and, uh, and developed the 450 for them. I did the same thing with Suzuki. So now I had the chance basically to be a developer of electric. So I'm like, in my career, I have the chance to be at the, the start of new things who are big things. And that's definitely something that when Anton came to me, I'm like, I like that. Yeah. I like, I like the idea. way that you said you were kind of thinking of doing something else. And now, man, you've jumped in with both feet. Like, because oh. cause you've literally like got say, on board with a project that's like... <laughs> I'm white or black. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, there's, <laughs> like, you were going to exit the sport, and, we, and now we know, like, you're... Because it clearly, like, you're loving what you're doing. Oh, that, I that's love it. apparent, sure. following you around the tour and working with the lads and the whole project. Yeah. And, and that, like, to come back to your things, I'm like... Every writer has his style, every writer has his character, and you need to be able to, to give him what they, they need yeah. and understand what they need. And, you know, like uh, last, last weekend, I was actually, that's the first race that I missed. Um, but I was still watching all the race on TV and, you know, watching live. Yeah. That was amazing. And I'm like, hey guys, you know, I mean, I mean, you should, you should, you know, try to do this on the bike, and because Making I know the notes. bike, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I know the bike, you know, from from A to Z. And I'm like, hey, you know, you have a little thing there. I mean, you should try this and this. And actually, Jack, I was going to highlight it. this because Jack didn't even, Jack didn't even know on a start that you could that you could change the sprocket. And you told him like, change. He didn't even know he had the option to change the sprocket. Oh, for sure. So, so and I'm like, like dude, well, you know, I mean, because he thought electric bike is just it's the gearing is what the gearing, yeah. and you just. I watch him ride on practice and I'm like, you know, you should try this. I think that will, you know, for me, what I see, I think you will get an extra. Yeah. And, and actually he went, that yeah. was way better for him. He did say that. He yeah. did say that you were right. 
I, I, so I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't need to be right. I no, just, so you know, just of, I, I'm it like... It does help to be right, though. No, for sure. It's always good. <laughs> it's really hard. <laughs> but, I mean, I'm there to, to help the guys and give them option, yeah. you know, and that's... I think the, the big part of a uh, stock, we have a lot of young guys, long engineer, very motivated. And, you know, when I came back on Monday and I do the report of what happened during the weekend, I mean, they, they are all like, okay, you know, what do we need to improve? How can we do it? And they are like, you know, they are very open. Yeah. And that's amazing because, you know, I come back and then we talk, we sit, uh, sit around with the engineers and say, okay, you know, this is this and this. And they say, let's plan it, let's make it happen. And that's, that's the way, I mean, and we keep, you know, from the first race to now, we are better and we're going to keep pushing and, and working it out. I see a little trip to Barcelona coming out. Well, so. We need to go and uh, go and check these guys out. I see can't that. Over there. Sounds yeah, for right. sure. Um, Sebastian, it's been an absolute pleasure. We could probably talk and we could, well, apart from noisy diggers and stuff. <laughs> we could talk for we hours, do our man. best with that, guys. Um, we could talk for hours, but you've got work to do. We've got work more. I've got nothing to, to do. Done. I'm happy days. Um, we'll let <laughs> you go. You can still talk on site. <laughs> you've got to go and sort your team out now and get them all set up. Uh, thanks for spending your time with You're us. You're welcome. Uh, Anytime. Thanks, that was you great. Gentlemen. Thank you. As I always. appreciate it. There you go. Always. Sebastian Tortelli. Uh, it's stark. It's, it's the future for him and many others, I'm sure. Nice oh, one. To, uh, to be there all the time. Yeah. Okay. We'll see you uh, next time. We don't know with who yet, but I uh, hope you enjoyed that one. And uh, once again, big shout out to Talon and everybody supporting us.